The opposite of fear is bravery. Hmm. Nope. The opposite of fear is curiosity. Is the glass half empty? Is it half full? That misses the point. Elevating curiosity will help you see and understand what's in the glass. This is Applied Curiosity Lab Radio, the podcast of curiosity. In each episode, Becky Saltzman interviews unconventional thinkers and doers in her unconventional way to dissect and uncover what you can use to see things others miss, make better decisions, and apply your talents in new and profound ways. Elevate curiosity, escape the boundaries of ordinary. Usually, we'll go down an alley system, and that's designed to make sure, again, that it's as stress-free as possible, lighting is taken into great consideration, uh, noise, handling of that animal, try not to touch it as least as you can, and just, just try to keep it calm as it's going in. Hello, curiosity seekers and adventurous thinkers. Welcome to Applied Curiosity Lab Radio, episode six. I am your host, Becky Saltzman, and today's episode may require many of us to elevate curiosity in a different sort of way. But hey, that's the point of the podcast, so let's have at it, because today's episode, I am speaking with Nathan Parker. Nathan is a meat scientist. He's an instructor in the Animal and Rangeland Sciences Department at Oregon State University. What's a meat scientist? Great question. Nathan studies the history and origins of the U.S. meat industry, the meat animal growth and development, and carcass composition, muscle conversion to meat biochemistry, carcass fabrication, the use of non-meat ingredients and their functionality in processed meat, meat biology and food safety, and he manages the USDA Inspected Meat Science Laboratory. He also recently lost 160 pounds, and it'll be fun to delve into how he did that. But before I get started giving you a little bit of a background into what you're going to expect to hear and learn in today's episode, I want to talk just a wee bit about triggers, because for some people, understanding and learning about how animals become things that land on our dining room table is an uncomfortable thing to think about. And for some vegetarians, perhaps they don't want to think about it at all. And certainly you're entitled. But that also makes me think about how many other things we don't want to think about. So we just kind of bury our heads in the sand or we create words for things like boots on the ground because we don't want to talk about the fact that these are real humans on the ground. So I just want to encourage everyone that I am respectful of triggers and particularly if you have a mental health disorder and you have to manage your own triggers, that is absolutely something I respect and I encourage you to pay attention to. If things just make you uncomfortable and you rather not know about them, then you need to understand what that means for the unintended consequences of not knowing about something. And I would encourage you then to elevate curiosity ahead of criticism and judgment, fear and complacency, and have a listen, because I found this to be a fascinating interview with Nathan. I learned a tremendous amount. We delved into things like, why does meat turn brown? And what do you look for when you're buying meat and what to avoid? So there's some real practical, actionable bits. We talk about what the USDA inspectors do and how these inspectors work. And is there any kind of politics involved in these inspections? And how does that affect the meat we eat? We talk about what happens when a cow looks like it has mad cow disease or some other kind of distressful disease and how the inspections handle these kinds of things. One of the areas that Nathan has studied extensively is how to extend the shelf life of meat and particularly using hazelnuts. So there's some interesting science and we delve deep into the weeds of science and he gets into some very technical things, but I encourage you to stick with it because I think that the rewards of what you'll know at the end of this will be worth delving through some of the science. And for the science lovers in some of us, I think you're going to get a real kick out of some of this. And, you know, to get back to the trigger warning aspect, I'd like to let everyone know that we talk very extensively about the slaughter process and how it differs for cows, hogs, and sheep. 
And for some, that might be cringeworthy. But again, I encourage you, if it doesn't involve an extreme mental stress of triggering, I encourage you to elevate curiosity and stick with this because like I said, you'll come out the other end of this interview a lot wiser, not only as a consumer, but also just as a citizen. So without waiting any further, I bring you my conversation with Nathan Parker. Hey, Nathan, thanks so much for being here at Applied Curiosity Lab Radio. Yes, thank you for having me on. I'm looking forward to the opportunity. We met in kind of a weird place, but a very cool place. I am a Portland, Oregon native, and I have never been to Eastern Oregon. So we took a trip to Eastern Oregon, Pendleton, Oregon, and then Joseph, Oregon. And then we went to the Hell's Canyon, which is, I think it's like 40 miles from Joseph, Oregon, but it took us three hours to get there. I didn't realize it was the deepest gorge in North America, deeper than the Grand Canyon. It is, little known fact, yeah. Little known fact and gorgeous. My husband and I went to Lake Wallawa and took that tram. I think it's 3,700 feet vertical ascent up to the top of Mount Howard. And we met you and your brother there, and you had on a really interesting hat. I think that's what started the conversation. Do you remember? I think that maybe talking about bear hunting as well. Oh yeah, bear hunting. Yes, I was asking you guys about bear hunting. We'll have to, we'll see if we can get to the bear hunting. Oh, I love bears, but you know, the whole hunting thing we were talking about, and then you had on your meat scientist hat. And I said, oh, what is a meat scientist? And then that started the whole conversation. And your background, as I've gotten to know you, your background is fascinating. And I can hardly wait to dive in to learn all about what a meat scientist is, the meat science industry, the meat industry. But before we get started, I'm curious how you lost 160 pounds in a year and a half. I wish I had a cool story or, you know, it was a magic pill or bullet or whatever, but simply calories in, calories out, enough time went by and a little bit of determination thrown in there too. So what does that look like? You used to get up in the morning and eat X and then you started getting up in the morning and eating Y or you used to do X and then you did Y. I got up in the morning and ate everything in sight pretty much (laughs) and then throughout the day and throughout the night and then repeat for too many years of my life, I think. And then basically when I was I was 26 years old and I was thinking, you know, I'm, I'm in my 20s and I shouldn't be living life like this. You know, I want to enjoy my younger years and uh, kind of had an epiphany or, as my friend Jake would say, a a come to Jesus moment. Come to Jesus moment, yes. And uh, it was January 2nd of 2014. I snapped a a selfie of a four and I was like, well, this is the last time that I'm going to look like this and joined a gym, started going, just uh, walked on the treadmill. And it also helps, you know, working on campus. I was a grad student at Oregon State University and you know, you park off campus, you walk to work, and then you walk back. So that helps. You go to class. And I educated myself on different foods and, you know, what I should be eating, what I should not be eating, uh, what they contribute to the to the body. Again, counted calories. I expended more than I consumed. I tried to shoot for that every single day. And uh, the formula worked, kind of adjusted to my BMR as I lost more weight. And by June of 2015, I had lost, uh, since I started, I started at 329 pounds and I wound up at 169 pounds, gained a little bit back. Yeah, it was quite a journey, uh, something I'm you know, pretty proud of and life just got exponentially better once that happened. So, Fantastic. So you have a graduate degree in meat science. Is yes. it food science or is it specifically meat science? It's actually technically animal science. Oh, animal science. Okay. So at Oregon State, we have Animal and Rangeland Science Department, which is the department that I work in. And we also have a food science department, but we don't have a specific meat science. So it's kind of a a meshing of the two, but technically it would fall under Department of Animal and Rangeland Sciences. I, I see. So while you were losing weight, were you applying what you knew from food science or animal science that you didn't apply before? I mean, was there some kind of knowledge that you obtained in your studies that you applied or you just finally kind of put it all together and applied it to yourself, but it's all stuff that you already knew? 
I would say so. You know, a lot of the classes that I would take would uh, focus on, well, not, you know, animal nutrition and different uh, feeding regimes that you're incorporating into an animal's diet and what's that doing to the muscle tissue, adipose tissue, what it's doing to the body. And then some of the seminars that I would go to, they would discuss uh, human nutrition as well. And then through my own research, I realized how important some of these phytonutrients are that, uh, that we consume or that animals consume to the body. So I kind of use that to educate myself on, you know, well, maybe what should I be eating? Things higher in uh, omega-3 fatty acids or foods higher in antioxidants. So, yeah, I, I would definitely say that I applied what I had learned to my own diet. Hmm. That's brilliant because sometimes can be esoteric. You learn something, but then we don't necessarily apply it to our own lives. So that's a cool and very literal application with measurable, significantly measurable results. I love that. If you're standing in front of an auditorium, for example, of high school students and their parents, how would you describe the job of a meat scientist? Glamorous, of course. (laughs) no, not exactly. I guess the best way to describe it would be the study of meat, which kind of goes without saying, but it's very interdisciplinary. So it incorporates a lot of uh, different fields of science into its study. So, for example, biology, chemistry, organic chemistry, biochemistry, microbiology, and then, you know, additionally, food engineering and product development material science, so different packaging materials that you'll find meat commonly packaged in and presented at retail. But, you know, additionally, tying back to our department, the animal science department, animal nutrition. So things that you're feeding to the animal, what's that going to do to the end product, the the meat that we're going to be consuming? Also, you know, are there any advantages or detriments to human health by feeding them certain feeds? And also animal welfare, humane treatment of animals, genetics as well, how genetics influence meat products. I'd say the best way to encompass everything is to say that it encompasses all different fields of science. That makes sense. Are there issues that you're discussing primarily about globalization and meat, about preservation and meat, about output and how to get more of it? the nutrition of meat? What are some of the hot topics being discussed in the meat industry? Uh, Would that be contentious issues or uh, just kind of novelty? That's a great question. That's a great follow-on question. Yeah, start with the contentious issues. Start with the controversy. So you'll always have, you know, mass production of of animals or the the term, which I don't like, uh, referred to as factory farming. Mm Mm-hmm. And whether or not that's an ethical way to do it. Is factory farming always mean the same thing to everyone? I mean, when we hear the word factory farming, it's kind of off-putting. But is that a specific application that kind of always connotes a certain thing or always denotes a certain way of farming? I think more or less it's just the idea of mass, mass production, mass slaughter of animals to keep up with our demand for meat. It's not, you know, hobby farming. It's not local or, you know, they throw out sustainable. That, that's the best way that I could answer that. Mm-hmm. It's just producing en masse quantities of meat through large facilities that some can slaughter up to six to 7,000 head of cattle, for example, a day. That'd be the, the best way that I could describe, I guess, what that term means. Okay. But are there misconceptions with regard to some of the more contentious issues? I guess, you know, going back to factory farming, perhaps that the animals aren't treated humanely or that uh, conditions in the plant are more unsanitary than a smaller plant would be, which is not true. Every plant, whether it be small, whether it be large, we're bound by the Humane Slaughter Act of, of 1958. What is that? That basically ensures that there is humane treatment of the animal before slaughter and enduring. So, for example, they have to be ambulatory. They have to be able to walk into the facility under their own power. And then when you slaughter them, unless it's for religious slaughter purposes like halal or kosher slaughter, they have to be rendered, and this is the term, quote unquote, insensible to pain 
prior to exsanguination or bleeding of that animal. Do they have to be insensible? Yeah, so brain dead for okay. lack of a, of a better term. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you know, beef you commonly use in large scale industry, a pneumatic bolt gun, which drives a retractable bolt rod into the frontal lobe of the animal's brain. So they're brain dead, but their heart's still beating. And you need that to facilitate pumping blood out of the animal after you bleed it, because that can lead to meat quality issues if you don't try to bloodlet as much as you possibly can. In the uh, pork industry, they typically use electricity for stunning or CO2 to anesthetize them. Mm -hmm. And then electro uh, stunning methods commonly are used for poultry plants. And has the law changed at all? You said 1958. Is that the year that that law was in effect? Yes. Yeah. And it, it got amended, I believe, in 1978. And is there talk of amending it further or does the industry, the people in the know or the industry, are they pretty united in feeling like that is sufficient or are there a lot of contentious arguments around what constitutes humane slaughter or is that just outside of the meat industry where that argument is made? Yeah, so it, it was amended in 1978 and that gave USDA, FSIS, Food Safety and Inspection Service uh, inspectors the ability to suspend operations if any kind of cruelty was observed during slaughter. Mm -hmm. And I, I think not too much as far as how animals are handled in today's industry has changed much. Your objective is to get a good stun of the animal in the first time. And if, God forbid, that doesn't happen, for example, here at our facility at OSU, we have a backup gun. We are basically on the ball, ready to stun the animal again if you get an ineffectual stun the first time. And if you don't, if you're having problems with your stunning procedures, then the USDA, who's there, they're watching everything, can write you a noncompliance report. And you have to go through your corrective actions and your, your HACCP plan to make sure that this doesn't continue to happen. And if you get too many of these NRs, these noncompliance reports, then they will shut you down. From a, a business standpoint, you have great incentive to do things the right way. But more or less from a, a moral and ethical uh, standpoint, you have great incentive to do things the right way and, and do right by that animal that's essentially giving its life to feed someone. Right. So the mass farming that you were talking about that is controversial, the difference isn't how in how the animals are treated or how the animals are slaughtered necessarily. It's just the sheer quantity of this same process that makes people cringe. But there's not a difference in actually how the animals are treated. Is that accurate? No. Whether it's a classified as a very, very small plant uh, like at OSU, for example, where we do, you know, less than 30 animals in a given calendar year, or you're a very large plant doing upwards of 7,000 head of cattle in a day, the laws and regulations apply the same right, as, that, far yeah. as, as far as abiding by the Humane Slaughter Act and making sure that uh, you are ab abiding by those regulations. That makes sense. So the people who are anti those larger farms, really, the only argument I guess they could make that would be valid is just the sheer number, the efficiency, not so much the humanity. Right. I think you're, you hit the nail on the head there as far as what their contention is. And that's just the volume. And perhaps, you know, their mentality is we shouldn't be farming or producing an agricultural commodity in, in that grade of quantity. Folks are entitled to think that way. But the, the important thing to keep in mind is that it's not necessarily done the wrong way. There's still food safety and, and animal welfare that's being taken into consideration, you know, whether it's small time production or large time production. Yeah, that makes sense. What's the most common question that you're asked about what you do versus what should people ask to better understand what we need to know about meat? Oh, that's a good one. Well, a, a lot of, you know, what I'm asked 
from students in, in the class that I teach. And keep in mind, I've, I've only been technically a meat scientist since December of 2016. So, You're a newly minted meat scientist. Newly minted meat scientist. <laughs> so I haven't got all of the questions quite yet, but a, a lot of it does focus around uh, the slaughter process and, and what exactly is happening during that. Normally, I try to break it down step by step from when the animal arrives until it goes through the facility and is fabricated into half of a carcass, into wholesale cuts and retail cuts, and then ground product, common muted product. Okay, so take us through that process. I know that there's some people that eat meat that are going to cringe, and there's some people that don't eat meat that that might cringe, and there's people that, right. like me, who are just wildly curious. Take us through that whole process. I want to know what happens before I slice something delicious and put it in my gullet. Okay, <laughs> fair <laughs> enough. The first thing that's going to happen is the animal's going to arrive at the facility, and you know a, a lot of the bigger plants will have uh, holding pens on site there where they drop the cattle off and they let them calm down because transportation is very stressful to an animal. Here at OSU, they're not coming very far from our farm facilities, you know, before they they get to the processing facility. But common practice is that once they arrive at the facility, they'll be allowed to have water and calm down. Stress is very bad on the animal from its psyche, its mindset, but also in a meat quality standpoint. Oh, really? Hold on. Can you touch on that a little bit before you go through the slaughter process? How does stress affect the quality of the meat? Yeah, so you have, you know, a few different conditions that can happen in terms of meat quality. Common practice is that you take the animal off of feed oh, about 24 hours prior to slaughter. And the reason why you do this is because, well, number one, you don't want to be paying for ruminal or stomach content in the animal on a live weight basis. But additionally, it has to do with food safety as well. When you go to eviscerate or gut the animal, you don't want it to have a distended stomach that you could potentially pop with your knife and have bacteria get on the carcass. So it's a food safety issue. So usually because they haven't had food or feed and, you know, they're in a foreign environment that, you know, they don't like being in necessarily, that can uh, start their glycolytic process a lot sooner. So they're relying on anaerobic glycolysis for energy production. And what that means is that usually there's a buildup of lactic acid in their muscle, which drops the pH of the meat. And that condition would be called uh, like pale, soft, and exudative in pork, for example. It would be what? Can you repeat that, please? Pale, soft, and exudative. So the meat becomes very white and starts to exude water from the muscle and basically that condition is going to result in you know let's say if you have a pork loin and you're going to cut that into pork chops and the hog was stressed uh, immediately prior to slaughter you know it's in a plant that that doesn't you know it doesn't like the sights or the sounds and it starts to uh, its muscles start to tremor it's basically going to go into glycolysis a lot sooner and that short-term stress is going to release lactic acid into the muscle and when that happens by the time you slaughter it normally the lactic acid would go back to the liver for resynthesis but if you bleed the animal you've killed the animal you've bled it that lactic acid is going to build up in the muscle which is going to reduce the the ph of that muscle to about 5.1 or 5.2 and i guess it's important to keep in mind that normal post-mortem muscles around 5.6 So the closer you get to this 5.1, 5.2 pH value, it's called the isoelectric point. And at that point, there's the same number of positive and negative proteins. And these proteins are going to be attracted to one another instead of to water. So if they're not binding water, they're releasing water from the uh, intracellular part of the muscle, which is going to leak out. So that condition is what we call pale, soft, and exudative, and it's going to result in a, a large discount for those products and they're not probably going to be used for a retail cut so it's very bad for the the meat processor so you try to keep the animal as stress-free as possible could a consumer see a meat product and learn to identify by just looking at meat in a grocery store or at a butcher shop could we 
learn to identify distressed meat? Or is that something that really happens on such a molecular level that we wouldn't be able to see any telltale signs of qualitatively stressed versus non-stressed meat as a consumer? Oh, yes, you, you absolutely can. So I'll ask you a question. So you go to a supermarket and you're perusing the meat aisle. And let's say you want to buy a beef steak. You want to buy a ribeye mm -hmm. because they're delicious. And why wouldn't you? And what's the first visual appraisal that you're going to be looking at with that product? Color. Color. Meat color is very, very important. So let's say that you have a steer that was slaughtered and it was stressed uh, for a prolonged period of time before it was slaughtered. That's actually going to result in a higher pH. So that postmortem pH would be around 6, 6.0. And that's because it hasn't been on feed. It relied on glycolysis for energy production a lot sooner. And the uh, lactic acid was able to go back to the liver to be resynthesized. But by the time it was slaughtered, there wasn't a lot of lactic acid buildup in the muscle. So inherently, because it's closer or further away, I should say, from that isoelectric point of 5.1, 5.2, there's going to be more negative protein ions, and they're going to be attracted to water. So that water is going to hold very tightly in the interior of the meat. So it allows more light to penetrate into that product, that ribeye, for example. So it's going to appear very dark, and that's what we call dark, firm, and dry. And that's the opposite uh, condition to pale, soft, and exudative. So if you see that, are you more likely going to buy a bright cherry red ribeye or are you going to buy this dark one? I'm going to buy the bright cherry red ribeye, but I didn't know why other than maybe just training that that is better or maybe, I don't think I've ever read along, just a brown piece of meat that already looks cooked before it's cooked. I right. probably, when you're saying dark, are you talking brown or are you talking... So that would be more, that condition, dark, firm, and dry would be more, I guess, purplish. Now, I think what you're alluding to is, uh, I don't mean to go too biochemical in this I know, podcast. I, love, I it, love getting into the weeds. <laughs> I, I love getting into the weeds. But, you know, if we're still evaluating meat color at the supermarket and you see a steak that's brown, well, normally as humans, we're going to associate that with some kind of microbial contamination, right? It's probably spoiled. That's what I would think. Right. That's not necessarily the case, though. Meat color is primarily determined by a heme protein, an iron protein in the muscle called myoglobin. And this myoglobin, for example, when it's oxidized or when it's oxygenated, I should say, and it exists in what's called the, the ferrous iron state, it's called oxymyoglobin, and that's the bright cherry red color that we associate with fresh meat. For example, if we take oxygen out of that environment, we put it in a, uh, a food saver bag and it's anaerobically packaged, it's going to be purplish, and that's deoxymyoglobin. However, typically when you go to a retail store and you're going to eat a steak that night, it's probably going to be packaged in polyvinyl chloride, PVC overwrap. So a little styrofoam tray with some plastic wrap over it. Right, with that little soft thing underneath that absorbs some of the blood. I don't know what that's made of. Right. But. Or not blood necessarily, but, but moisture. Yeah. Moisture that that's, looks, the that's moisture that looks kind of bloody. Okay. Right. Yeah. And that's just the, uh, the myoglobin proteins mixed in with that, that water. And so it, it gives it that appearance or a little bit of hemoglobin too. That's residually left in there from blood and hemoglobin gives blood its pigment. So yeah, pigmentation is all dependent on the state of that myoglobin, the state of the ligands or oxygen binding to the sixth site, the sixth coordination site in the myoglobin heme iron. So getting back to that brownish color, what's happened there is that this iron, the iron that's uh, associated with myoglobin has been oxidized. It's converted from ferrous iron to ferric iron and it gives off this uh, different wavelength spectrum of this brown pigmentation. So Normally with this PVC overwrap meat, you know, you have a shelf life of about seven to 10 days before you can really notice it and a consumer is not going to buy that anymore. So that doesn't necessarily mean that it has bacteria on it or it's spoiled. It's just that that myoglobin has been oxidized and it's no longer visually appealing to the consumer. Is that why 
there are some meats that are injected with color, some kind of coloration that makes it look like the kind of fresh meat that we have been trained to buy? Well, normally what you'll see is that we'll try to incorporate antioxidants into either endogenously through feeding programs, you know, for, for livestock or exogenously through, well, a, a number of different antioxidants, rosemary extract, green tea extract, and then you got uh, synthetics like BHT, uh, BHA, TBHQ. So unpack uh, a little bit exogenous from outside, endogenous from inside. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. So for my research, for my, my master's, for example, our premise was to extend the shelf life of meat. So we wanted to retain that red color longer through feeding hazelnuts. So Oregon produces like 99% of the hazelnuts in the United States. That's kind of our comparative advantage. And hazelnuts are very high in alpha tocopherol, which is the main antioxidant that's found in pretty much any meat animal tissue. And these antioxidants work by, you know, scavenging free radicals produced during, you know, lipid oxidation or help retain pigment oxidation. So that would be an example of an endogenous approach by feeding hogs these hazelnuts and trying to extend the shelf life, the color of a pork chop, for example. And you see that similarly with, uh, you can do it with lamb, you can do it with beef, supplementing with alpha tocopherol acetate. So endogenous approach, then exogenous is anything you apply post-slaughter during the processing. And a lot of the times you'll see that in further processed uh, meats like sausages or, you know, any kind of a, a product where you're adding different ingredients, normally common muted product. Got it. I want to get back to the slaughter process, but while we are talking about people shopping for meat at the grocery store. What would you tell them, given the fact that brown meat doesn't necessarily mean that it's full of bacteria and the bright red meat doesn't necessarily mean it's qualitatively better, I guess, what would it be, better tasting or better for you or not even sure what better means. Are we talking better tasting or better for you? What should a consumer look for? What would be the number one tip that you would give consumers so that they are looking for meat that is either better tasting or meat that is better for you? And maybe those two things run in tandem. Maybe they don't. I don't know. That's a tough one to answer, considering everyone has different tastes. Are you saying some people would like meat after it's been sitting there for longer? Other people might like it when it's freshly packed or would, would anyone taste stressed out meat and think it's good or better than non-stressed meat? Is it that subjective? Well, if you had a pork chop, for example, that was from a, a pig that was slaughtered and was pale, soft, and exudative, it would be very watery, would taste very mushy and grainy. So yeah, that would be one that you probably would not want to consume. Conversely, if you actually have a dark, firm, and dry steak, that the color is very unappealing to the consumer. However, since the pH is high, it's holding on to more water. And if it's holding on to more water, it's probably going to be, you often associate that with more tenderness and juiciness of that product because when you go to cook it, invariably it's going to lose some moisture. So, you know, a lot of meat science is, is looking at trying to retain that water holding capacity of that product as long as possible from the time that you slaughter that animal to the time that you cook it and the consumer eats it. So that's not necessarily bad. But another thing that I would look for, if you like a good beef steak, for example, is intramuscular fat or the marbling within the loin eye. So usually I'm, I'm looking for something with streaking that's uh, fairly spread out equally throughout the, the loin eye and you don't have a big seam of fat or a lot of connective tissue either. So what does connective tissue look like when you're going grocery shopping and looking at the meat? So connective tissue, you know, normally muscles that require a lot of locomotion, especially from the leg. So for a Boston butt, for example, you're probably going to be putting that into a crock pot or slow cooking that. 
And there's a lot of connective tissue in there because the animal is using their leg for a, a lot of movement. So it requires having more connective tissue to facilitate that. So that's more about the cut than the yeah, specific exactly. piece of meat from from a T-bone steak. What's the, I don't even know. What's the most common kind of steak that you see at a grocery store? I'm not a big, I'm not a big cooker. I, I don't mind. I don't mind red meat, but it's not, I'm not a great chef when it comes to red meat. What is the most common is it a T-bone steak? Is it a filet? What's the most common steak? Yeah, you know, that kind of depends on region, but usually any kind of middle meat, and by middle meat, I mean something from the rib or something from the short loin. So yeah, T-bone steak is very popular. And then another iteration of a T-bone steak, you know, you can have the filet mignon or the tenderloin cut off of that. So and what would you look you... for in a good T-bone steak? Like if you're looking at different pieces of T-bone steak, from different, you know, at, a, at the butcher or from different farms at the grocery store, what would be just a couple of things that you could look at to know that you're getting perhaps a better, better piece of the same kind of cut? Well, number one, I'm going to be looking at uh, marbling okay. for certain, because, you know, when you go to, to bite into that, you know, fat melts and muscle is going to denature. The proteins and muscle are going to denature. So, you want a good equal dispersion of that to facilitate in a, a good mouth feel. And also fat lends itself to flavor as well in the meat. So that's normally what I'm going to be looking for. And again, I'm going to be appraising the color of that. You know, I'm going to see, well, how long has it been sitting out? If there's any kind of pigmentation oxidation going on, maybe some of the, the proteins have denatured and it's not going to be as tender consequently. And that would look so. more maroon than red or brown. Is that what you're saying? More brownish if it's brownish. been sitting out a little bit longer, yeah. Okay. Like on a, a T-bone steak, for example, you have two different muscles. You have the loin eye or the longissimus, and then you also have the tenderloin or the psoas major. And the psoas major or the tenderloin usually has a uh, higher oxidative stability, so it's going to oxidize faster or has a higher propensity for oxygen. So you might look at those that one cut, that T-bone, and you have – the loin eye that's a little bit more cherry red, and then you have the uh, filet mignon or the, the tenderloin that's a little bit lighter and brownish. So I might be looking at that, that tenderloin to kind of give me an idea, well, that, that's kind of been sitting out a little bit longer than this cut that's right next to it, for example. Ah, that's okay. That's good. That's, that's helpful. Helpful for grocery shopping purposes. So now I put a pin in the slaughter process and you were early on, but I wanted to, since you were talking about how that related to cuts of meat, I wanted to give some, a little tip to shoppers. But going back to the slaughter process, you de-stress the animal. They have not eaten for a period of time so that you're not having a stomach full of potential bacteria and a number of other reasons which were interesting. Then what? First things first is required by by law is we have to do an antemortem inspection. The USDA, the inspector, has to do an antemortem ins inspection, which is basically, you know, pre-death. So the animal has to come off the trailer and you have to get a visual appraisal of it 360 degrees to make sure that it's ambulatory. It's it's walking fine. It's exhibiting no obvious signs of disease at that moment. How do you do that now, when you're slaughtering seven to 8,000 cattle a day? Is that something that's automated? Is that something? Well, they'll, you know, at a facility that big, they'll have a number of different USDA inspectors along the entire uh, assembly line, if you will, the entire line of when that animal comes in until when it's fabricated on the processing side. So there are USDA inspectors that just are at the same facility every day, day after day, or do these facilities slaughter that many and then go months and months before they slaughter? I don't even know how frequently they're slaughtering seven to 8,000 cattle. No, that, that's, that's normally a, a daily thing or five days out of the week or six days out of the week. So the U, those USDA inspectors are stationed permanently at those farms or slaughterhouses? Yeah, normally if it's a plant that big, they will be that plant's inspector. Now, here in Oregon, for example, in the Willamette Valley, our inspector that, that comes to the Clark Meat Science Center at Oregon State 
We'll also go to a number of other, you know, smaller plants as well. And there, we have some fairly decent sized plants here in the Willamette Valley, but, but nothing comparable to what you'd see in the Midwest. Is there ever talk of scandal in that these same inspectors are working with these same farms day in and day out? Or is that not something that you ever hear about? There has been issues in the past with that, with conflicts of interest, but the USDA, is, if, if that is the case, is on top of it as far as uh, making sure that doesn't go on for a long period of time. Once they catch it, you know, they normally nip it in the bud right there. Right. Uh, you know, and, and they take their job very seriously, and, you know, they're, some of the guidelines are very stringent. And as someone that has to put together these HACCP plans and HACCP stands for hazard analysis and critical control points. Basically, any food food or beverage processor has to have this HACCP plan. What does food, that stand for? Hazard analysis and critical control points. Okay. So it's basically a food safety plan, food safety intervention. It's ensuring that the public's uh, health, you know, as far as consuming any food or beverage item. Okay. So then when you put these plans together, you have to work closely with the USDA to verify that, you know, you have this plan. Not only do you have it, but you're following it and all of your documentation reflects that. So, so, they, so the animals are, they do a pre-mortem inspection. Yeah, so first thing that's going to happen is antemortem. Or and antemortem. if that animal does exhibit, a, you know, for example, BSC or, or mad cow disease, they will be condemned. They'll never see the inside of that facility. They'll be euthanized and taken off site and, you know, disposed of. What are some of the other things that they look for? And have you ever seen that? Is it pretty easy to tell? I never personally know of, have seen it. It's, it's very rare. And we, we have a lot of intervention steps to make sure that, uh, you know, outbreaks of, of mad cow don't happen. Similarly with uh, scrapie, which is another neurological disorder in, in sheep, that's another thing you're going to evaluate. So basically if the animal is acting erratic and can't walk and it's stumbling, I'm sure you can YouTube a, a video you know, from the 90s when there was outbreaks of, of mad cow in early 2000s to, you know, to see what that would look like. And it, it would be fairly obvious to all involved what's going on. Right. Uh, you know, the bigger issue is if an animal getting off the trailer breaks a leg and cannot walk into the facility, then then it has to be euthanized or it has to be taken off site and, and, and treated, I guess. The point is you can't forcibly take that animal into a facility and stun it and then go through the whole slaughter process. With because they have to be able, they have to be ambulatory and they have to be able to walk in on their own. That's part Correct. of the. OK, so once they do that, then what happens? Usually they'll go down an alley system and that's designed to make sure, again, that it's as stress free as possible. Lighting is taken into great consideration, uh, noise, handling of that animal. Try not to touch it as least as you can and just just try to keep it calm as it's going in. And you can Google any number of, you know, Temple Grandin, for example, Dr. Grandin has been instrumental in in designing facilities where it's low stress. I, and, love, I uh, love that movie with Claire Danes. We'll put that in the show notes. Interesting story about Temple Grandin is my very first week ever working at the Clark Meat Center at Oregon State. It was January of 2008, and I, I wasn't even College of Ag. No, I guess I was College of Ag. I was majoring in fisheries and wildlife at the time. I was kind of an aimless student, didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I knew I needed a job, you know, beer money and, and whatnot. <laughs> course. And I got a job at the, the Clark Meat Lab. And one day I went into work and my boss said, we're going to go over to one of the lecture halls. Uh, you know, Dr. Grandin is speaking. I have no idea who she is. So I go over there and, you know, she's kind of a eccentric character, if you will, you know. She has, <laughs> she has autism and she's highly functioning. So I, I watch her seminar and then she actually comes back to the meat center and she looks at our slaughter floor in our facility and she didn't like it one bit because our facility is kind of antiquated in all honesty. But we do have some, some state-of-the-art stuff there now, like a, a hydraulic knockbox, which is very good for getting good effectual stuns on, on beef cattle 
but that was my first recollection of her. And I, I had no idea who she was and what she means to animal science community and animal welfare. And then two years later, they came out with that movie with Claire Danes. And I was like, oh, my God, I, I, I met that woman. You know, that's cool. She's been very good as far as, you know, shedding light on humane handling of animals and also, uh, you know, humane slaughtering of animals and, and what's going on. She puts out these videos on YouTube. I believe they're called the Glass Wall Project. So, you know, everything that I would describe to you as far as the slaughter process, you can go on there and watch her videos and she'll, you know, walk you through what's happening. So wait, you said the Glass Wall Project? Yes. Okay, good. Well, again, that will be in the show notes as well. So what's next in the process? So the next thing that's going to happen is you're going to stun the animal. Again, you know, most commonly you're going to use a captive bolt pistol or a pneumatic uh, gun that fires a retractable rod into the frontal lobe of the animal's brain. So at that point, it's brain dead. Is there a skill um, in doing this that, that one has to learn, or is it set up to be pretty automated and easy? Yeah, well, normally, you know, at larger plants, you have one person that does it the entire time. That's, that's their job to do that. And That's uh, quite a job. Yeah, and you could, you could imagine, you know, six or 7,000 head of cattle a day gets very taxing. Yeah, and I think they have folks that come in and they switch off with their, their coworkers. But yeah, normally, you know, larger plants, it's, it's an assembly line like that. You've got one person doing this one specific job where at smaller plants, like, like here on campus, for example, our plant, you know, I, I have myself and then my student employees that get to do every phase of, of the slaughter process. Um, normally, you know, I, I do the stunning uh, just because I want to make sure that's done right. And if they're not comfortable doing that, the students, that is, then I'm not going to have them, you know, throw them to the wolves and have them go in and do that because obviously we take, you know, humane slaughter and, and getting a good stun the animal very seriously. Absolutely. So you stun the animals and then what happens? So after you stun, the, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to check for signs of cognition. Before you ever shackle a hind leg or get it up onto a rail, you're going to check for signs of cognition. And normally that has to do with uh, corneal reflexes. So you want to make sure that they're not blinking. Um, normally you take a light or you take your finger and you run it over the, uh, the eye to, to make sure there's no responsiveness. Um, additionally, if the tongue's hanging out, that's a good sign that you got a good effective stun and no active breathing. You don't want that animal to be trying to breathe or vocalize. And, you know, if, if all those things are coming together, that means you've got a good stun on the animal. And then after that, you normally shackle the hind leg, you get it up onto the rail, you'll, you know, at our plant, we get a live weight. And then from there you bleed or exsanguinate the animal. That's accomplished by severing the carotid artery or the jugular vein on either side of the trachea and esophagus. So when you bleed the animal, is the collection of blood in a specific way? Does it, is there some kind of process where it has to, X, Y, and Z has to happen? Or is it just a matter of sanitation? Does the way you bleed the animal have anything to do with what kind of cut of meat or the taste or anything other than kind of sanitary process? Because at this point, the animal's dead anyway. The biggest thing, and, and I guess everything that I'm describing after the stunning process is called the, the postmortem aspect of, of inspection. We obviously we make sure that well, even before we start slaughter operations or any plant starts slaughter operations, you do your pre-op inspection. So all the equipment has to be cleaned. USDA will inspect that, all of your knives. So before we, we stick the animal to bleed it, we're making sure that our knives are clean. And then if we make a secondary incision because you're going through the hide and you know, introducing potential bacteria into the bloodstream uh, by, you know, sticking the animal. We got to make sure that our knives are sterile and sanitized. We always have knife washes with 180 degree water, which instantaneously uh, sterilizes our knives. So I read somewhere where you saw a, a, a spider web in the facility <laughs> and kind of freaked out because that was not allowed. No, yeah, that was... Uh, what was that? A Corvallis Advocate article about four years ago. Yeah. Um, they came by to do an interview and we had not used the slaughter floor for a few weeks. And normally what I do is I have the students go in there and clean the floor entirely, even if they've and they, they do every time after slaughter, they sanitize the entire floor. 
I'll have them go in and do another rinse down prior to any slaughter. And yeah, we were doing that, uh, an interview and I saw a spider web and I just like, that's, you know, we need to get that thing down there. But yeah, I, I take sanitation very, very seriously. I think if you asked any of my student employees, they'd, they tell you maybe I'm too much of a slave driver on that, but, uh, I take food safety and consumer safety very seriously. And, you know, a lot of plants do. Well, that's why, um, that's why I would rather buy my meat from your retail. So we'll have a link to your retail store where yeah. people can buy your meat. Normally during the fall through the, uh, the academic year, which ends uh, second week of June, we are open on Fridays from 12 to 530 to the, the general public. All right. Well, I'll have to check you out. I'll drive down to Corvallis to get some nice, clean, spiderweb-free meat. So after (laughs) you do the bleeding, and then what happens? So after you bleed, we skin out the face and we remove the head. And uh, it kind of depends on the species, too. So I primarily describe beef. Hogs are a little bit different. So a hog, you're you're not going to really skin. Usually what you're going to do is you're going to scald a hog. And the water is like 140, 150 degrees Fahrenheit. And that will loosen the hair follicles to a point where you then transition that over to a de-herring machine, which is basically a big tumbler with paddles and that scrapes about, oh, 90% of the hair off from there. And then you take out your knife and try to shave it down as much as you can. Then you also use a a singer. So you'll use fire, you know, especially around the head and the feet to get any excess hair off the carcass. And, you know, with hogs, you're leaving the skin on. And that's because, you know, number one, if you try to skin a hog, they have a lot of subcutaneous fat and you end up removing a lot of that, which is going to decrease the yield. So obviously that's not a good thing. But additionally is a lot of pork products uh, that you make, you leave the skin on during the cooking process. So for example, you have a smoked ham or a bacon belly that you're going to, you know, slice bacon out of. You'll actually leave the rind on during the thermal processing uh, cycle and then remove it prior to further processing and packaging. Mm -hmm. So the process though, I mean, as far as you stun the animal, you bleed it, is gonna be the same for most species. So I'll kind of just walk you through beef the rest of the way. Sure, Uh, although I I love the detour to pigs and bacon. So yeah, but the beef is great. Yeah. Um, So you'll remove the head and the head will be inspected by the inspector. They'll look at mandibular lymph nodes. They'll check for any abnormalities in the tissue of the head. And then if if it passes, you can use the the tongue for a variety. So beef tongue, for example, you know, fairly popular cut. From there, we wheel the carcass down and we'll, what we do is we drop it down into a cradle and we start skinning. So you remove the hooves, it'll be belly up and you'll try to skin down as close to the vertebral column as you can get. You'll then split open the brisket and then separate the trachea from the esophagus or the GI tract from the respiratory system. And that was going to aid in evisceration. And you'll also tie off the esophagus because you don't want any stomach fluid leaking out, you know, bacteria again, leaking out onto the carcass. And conversely, on the other end, you're going to cut out the rectum and we put a food safe bag over it and make sure no feces can get out on the other end. That's good. So as, as you keep going through, you're, you know, you're skinning, and you're, ex- you're exposing more tissue to the environment. And as you do that, you got to be very, very careful that none of that bacteria is going to be transferred onto that exposed tissue from the hide or from other sources. From there, we put trolleys through the uh, Achilles and we remove the rest of the hide. And in industry, they'd have a hide puller, which would automatically pull it right off using a big drum. We have to do it manually. We don't really have that uh, capability here. So what happens with the hides? So, you know, a lot of plants actually have on-site processing facilities where they'll drop into like a shoot system and they'll go to another part of the plant where they're processed and then shipped for, for tanning and, you know, make different products. Another important thing to keep in mind is anything that's not used for human consumption, these byproducts, animal byproducts, will be used in various ways. So hides for leather and then collagen, additionally from the leather, you know, you can make casings out of that. You can make gelatin products out of that. Viscera, you can make, again, natural casings out of different parts of the intestinal tract. What would be something uh, that foods, what would be something that was made out of the intestinal tract? That we like commonly consume? Yeah. Would, would that be from, like sausage covers or is that casings? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, so like a, a natural hog casing or a natural sheep casing, you would extract the middle layer of the intestinal tract 
And this is essentially sterile, but it also be sterilized at the plant that is producing those. And then it's kind of funny because you're stuffing more meat back into that, you know, and reusing that. <laughs> right. But yeah, there's just a number of different products, cosmetics, soaps that are made from animal viscera or, or byproducts or what we call offal. So, you know, the important thing to keep in mind is we try to utilize as much of that animal as possible, not just what we consume at a grocery store in the meat aisle. Do you do that in your slaughterhouse? Do you have a way to get all of those byproducts to the various resources that use them? Or is that you difficult? Know, we, we don't. You know, you have to be pretty specialized. And what we do is we have a, a rendering company that comes out of Portland and then they take it up to a plant and process, render it down, and then process it into various products from there or have it shipped off to be made at, you know, another plant after they've rendered it down. Okay. And, you know, there, there are certain things I was talking about, you know, making sure that we don't have mad cow getting back into the food system or scrapey. There are certain things that you cannot render. So, for example, from beef of any age, the, the tonsils and the, uh, the distal part of the ileum, which is the, the small intestine, an eight-foot portion of that you have to remove because it has glands associated with it that may have these prions. And these prions are uh, what leads to mad cow disease. And essentially what a prion is is a misfolded uh, protein with no DNA or RNA transcription in it. And if you consume these as humans and, you know, it gets into your system, it leads to what's called Crutzfeld jacobs disorder, you know, which will essentially, I'm sure that you could Google or YouTube a video of that, you know, of people that have, have gotten that. And it's basically a neuro neurological disorder that shuts down your body and eventually kills you, you know. So that's why we take it very seriously. And then cattle 30 months or older, those things that I'd mentioned already, plus the vertebral column and the head cannot be used. So those have to be composted because any kind of rendering or heat treatment will not kill these prions. Is it something you see or is it something that is just so prevalent in that part of the small intestine that you just assume it's there and don't use the, that part? You know, it's something that if, if you really wanted to know for certain, you'd have to do take a biopsy ah, and send okay. it in and have it evaluated. But we don't even take that risk. No plant will take that risk. You know, we're, we're mandated by the USDA to remove that. So that's what we do. And then that gets composted. So, you know, we have separate barrels that are designated specified risk material, SRMs, that will then compost, and that will not be taken by the renderer. The renderer knows that, you know, that's for this plant to dispose of and not us. So we, we try to make sure that that's not getting back into any kind of human food system where we're going to consume it and it's going to lead to some kind of an outbreak. So after you get rid of the parts that you cannot use, then is it just a matter of cutting up the usable parts into their various into their various packaging, or do you send the, send the stuff away to be packaged? What are, you, what are the kind of final steps to get from that point to where the consumer can purchase? So after we get the hide off, we'll go ahead, we'll eviscerate the animal, and the inspector will look at uh, the kidneys, the heart, the liver, the lungs, again, making sure there's no signs of disease. If the heart and the liver pass, you know, we can use those, again, as variety meats. And then from there, for beef, for example, we're going to split the carcass in two into halves. And then I, I mentioned HACCP and these critical control points. So what we're trying to make sure at, at that part with our CCPs is that we're controlling any reasonably likely outcome that, you know, the carcass could be contaminated with bacteria, which is going to be injurious to your health as a consumer. So the first thing we, that we do is we have our CCP, which is called trim zero tolerance. So any hair dirt, ingesta, fecal matter, milk, if it was a lactating cow, has to be trimmed off with a hook in our knives. So any tissue that was exposed to that, we have to cut off. We can't pick it off with our fingers. We can't rinse it down with a hose at that point. We have to cut off any visible contamination. And from there, that's when we do our inspection. That's when we get the inspector. The inspector will look at it. Hopefully it passes. And at that point, it's officially USDA passed and inspected. And then at that point, we can go ahead and rinse it down with warm water, let it drip dry for five minutes. And then CCP number two is uh, an antimicrobial intervention. So it's our organic acid spray. So we use acetic acid, which creates a very acidic environment on the exterior of the carcass. Is that a common uh, thing used 
is this acid used at pretty much all slaughterhouses or is there some discretion as to what you can wash it down with the carcass? Yeah. So normally acetic acid and lactic acid are used at, you know, smaller plants just because they're very affordable and very effective. Normally, you know, these, these bigger plants that we've been talking about, you know, where basically th this carcass is on a rail the entire way over to the processing line, the boning line, they'll go through pretty much a, a 360 degree vat where it's being hit with steam pasteurization. And they'll probably use some kind of a, a misting solution, a proprietary blend. They might use lactic acid or acetic acid in tandem with this to make sure that there's uh, a, you know, a very low likelihood that there's any pathogenic contamination on that carcass. A big part of this too is we're gonna be swabbing that carcass. It depends on your frequency. So the more you do, normally your frequency is gonna be a little higher. Us, for example, at the meat center, every lot or five steers or cows or whatever that we slaughter, we have to randomly pick one of those carcasses and then swab it and send those samples off to be evaluated for E. coli and make sure that those come back below the threshold that the USDA has sent. And that's, set. And that's required. That's part of that the required, is required, pro yeah. required protocol. And then is there more processing before the cuts are cut or... At that point, is it ready to be butchered? Normally what you'll see is some aging going on prior to. So the carcass is going to go into rigor mortis and the muscles are going to remain contracted. And the whole premise behind aging is, so a muscle, for example, is comprised of all these sarcomeres, which is a contractile unit of, of a muscle. And each sarcomere goes from what's called a, a Z line to a Z line. And during the aging process, these uh, Z proteins are broken down by calpanes, and it basically lengthens the sarcomere, which is going to create more tenderness in that, that carcass and eventually in that, that cut of meat. So you want to so, give it some time for this process to occur, and that's what you – is that what it means when you hear about aged beef? Yes, absolutely. You know, And you'll see that too with dry aging or – They'll have uh, a rib or a short loin in a dry aging cabinet at like a high-end steakhouse. That's essentially what they're trying to create there is, you know, the more time you let it age, given the right amount of airflow in this chamber and humidity and, and everything else to make sure there's not a lot of mold growth, is trying to have these calpanes break down these sarcomeres to, you know, equate to more tenderness. So is that in, like a post rigor mortis state? essentially? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's what you'd call the, the resolution phase of, of rigor mortis. Okay. So then that's the aged process where it needs to be in the right kind of environment. You don't obviously want it to age too long or in the wrong yeah. environment or then it's just rotten. But so that happens before it's cut into the various cuts or, or. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, normally you'll, you'll age on the rail and then from there you start your fabrication process. So you take this side of beef that you have, and then you'll break it down into, into what's called primals or wholesale cuts. So you'll have your chuck, you'll have your rib, your loin, and then your round. And then from there, you further break that down into subprimals and then ultimately retail cuts that you're going to glean off of that carcass. You know, anything like ground beef, for example, those typically come from the chuck or the round, not the middle meats. And, you know, normally things with a lot of connective tissue, we're using some kind of mechanical means like a grinder or a bowl chopper to help disrupt those, connect that connective tissue so it's, you know, more, more tender. That makes sense. And then it's just a matter of packaging. I'm sure there's a tremendous amount of science that goes into packaging alone. New technologies, although to me it looks probably the same, styrofoam with some kind of, which looks like some kind of wrapping over it. I'm sure that there's been tremendous research behind how to package and store meat. Yes, absolutely. Packaging is a, a very big part of the meat industry and, and meat science. Commonly, we were talking about you go to find a, a beef steak at the store and it's going to be in that styrofoam tray with some PVC overwrap. Um, that's that's short-term packaging. So normally like a Safeway or a Fred Meyer, they're going to do that on site. It's going to be shipped, however, normally anaerobically because that shelf life on that product without any oxygen, you know, working on that product can last upwards of a year to two years if that seal holds. Another way to package a product that's 
fairly expensive, but it's becoming increasingly more popular is what's called modified atmospheric packaging. So they'll have like a tray and some headspace. And you normally see this a lot on like ground turkey. Mm -hmm. And they'll have an, an environment of nitrogen and carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide in there. And that extends the shelf life. In the packaging where, th is that what you're saying? That Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. So they'll introduce these gases. And again, we talked about that myoglobin and that heme iron, and it binds different ligands that, you know, depending on what's in the environment. So for example, it, it actually has this myoglobin has a very high affinity for carbon monoxide. And it, that carbon monoxide actually induces the same bright cherry red color that oxygen, diatomic oxygen does. And by doing this, you know, and you have nitrogen in there, you can extend the shelf life with this, this gaseous headspace by up to 28 days compared to PVC overwrap, which is, you know, seven days. And so, you still have that same coloration effect. So when you're looking at the future of meat science, what is one thing, let's just say, that you think we will be talking about in 20 years that no one is thinking about now in terms of either meat consumption or how we store meat or from where we get meat? Are there some hot topics on the horizon that we will look back and say, I remember when we didn't even talk about X? For my familiarity, and you know, I apologize if I omit kind of the, the latest and greatest that's on the horizon. Again, I'm still kind of a, an up and coming budding meat scientist. But you know, things that I'm familiar with are clean label meat products, utilization of, of byproducts to create you know, these, these clean labels. So for example, we're, we're doing a study here at Oregon State right now where we're using hops beta acids, which are byproducts, the stems and the leaves of the hops brewing process for beer and extracting these, these acids as an antimicrobial agent to create this clean label on meat products. Hmm. So basically we're trying to see if we can reduce uh, microbial loads of meat products using you know, standard antimicrobials like uh, sodium lactate, potassium lactate, diacetate, where a consumer reads that on the label and it's, it's foreign to them, right? Like, well, that must be bad for me because I... It doesn't sound as healthy as hops. Let's just put it that right. way. Yeah. So you'd, you'd probably rather have something that has hops in it as opposed to that. I would. Yes. Uh, yeah, exactly. So with my familiarity, things like that, trying to create these clean organic labels, but also having, you know, an efficacious effect on consumer safety and, and the appeal of that product. Oh, that's a great answer. I will look for hops instead of some of these other chemicals and just use that as a justification to eat my yeah. hamburger with a nice IPA. There you go. If your son or daughter came to you and told you that they were going to be a vegan, what would you tell them? You're dead to me. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. Uh, where, where, did I, where did I go wrong? Where did, where did I, I go wrong? Okay. Well, this was fantastic. And before we depart for this round anyway, I have a couple of questions that I call quick curious questions or QCQs. And they're just fun questions that help the audience get to know you better and you're a fun person to know. So what is your favorite $100 purchase that you've made in the last year or so? Well, I would have to say the ticket to go to the top of Mount Howard, the, the tram, yeah, uh, otherwise, sweet. you know, I, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. That's a good answer. And it is amazing. I mean, the... and yeah, that view was spectacular. I also paid $30 to get into Glacier National Park a couple weeks ago. Oh, I think things like that, where you're going and you're seeing places and it's not necessarily materialistic because I'd rather have memories than things. Adventure. Absolutely. Exactly. Glacier Park. What kind of boat or ship or how did you access it? I took the old uh, four-wheel drive sleigh over there. And my, my girlfriend currently lives in Montana. So I picked her up and then we uh, ventured north in the Dodge and uh, made our way up there, which is very kind of got a little precarious. I don't know if you've ever been up the uh, highway to the Sun Road. No. Or going, go, excuse me, going to the Sun Road, which goes to the top of Logan Pass. 
up no. there, but uh, it, it's not really, um, I guess, intended for uh, larger vehicles. So, <laughs> but somehow, <laughs> by the grace of God, we made it safely up and safely back down. So, well, then it's it's uh, that it's good in hindsight. Right. What is the one piece of advice that you would give your twenty year old self? And I don't I don't know what you were doing. You're probably in college at twenty. Stop drinking so much beer, perhaps. <laughs> 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 six years from now, you're going to have a your come to Jesus moment and uh, <laughs> you're going to have some weight to lose. Um, I don't know. I guess, you know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't change anything. Like I kind of talk about this all the time, like with, with friends and family. It's like, you know, do you have any regrets? And I, I don't. I guess I have, you know, maybe some due difference. But my, my 20 year old self led to where my 30 year old self is. So, you know, I, I can't complain. Absolutely. Maybe you would tell yourself, invent Facebook. But other than that, no regrets. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And what is one thing that you believe that most people think is crazy? Oh, that's another good one. <laughs> ghosts, perhaps. Ah. I, do, I do believe in ghosts, but some people probably would call me crazy because I do. Well, that's, that, I, that's fair. That, that ghost hunter show is pretty convincing, so... <laughs> Those are all good answers. And I just want to know what one other thing, which is where can people find you? Where would be a good place if they want to get in touch with you, learn more about what you do, learn more about the industry? Normally you can find me at Sky High Bar in downtown Corvallis on any given night uh, if you wanted to find me personally. but uh, <laughs> Sky High Bar, okay. As far as uh, learning more about meat science, I guess go to Oregon State University's uh, webpage. Uh, you can type in Clark Meat Science Center or Department of Animal Rangeland Sciences, and uh, all of my contact information should be there. Additionally, it should give a little bit of a, a background on what we do as well as our retail store. So uh, that'd probably be my, uh, my best advice as far as getting a hold of us here, getting a hold of me uh, personally to talk about anything meat science or meat industry related. Perfect. And we'll have... Like I said, we'll have all of your contact and all of your resources and suggestions in the show notes at appliedcuriositylab.com forward slash blog. Thank you so much, Nathan. This has been great. I've loved learning all about this process, and I really appreciate your taking the time. Yes, thank you. I appreciate you having me on. Nathan Parker is a meat scientist an instructor at Oregon State University Animal and Rangeland Sciences Department, and runs a USDA-inspected meat science laboratory. Thanks so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. Before you take off, I have a quick question and a few more things to let you know about. One, you can find show notes and all resources mentioned at appliedcuriositylab.com forward slash blog. And the question... Would you enjoy joining the ranks of curiosity seekers and adventurous thinkers? If so, you are invited to join the Tribe of the Curious. You'll receive Quick Curiosity Monday. This short weekly email is curiosity lube for your brain. It consists of ideas I'm pondering, curiosities the tribe has shared, and things that I'm enjoying that I suspect you might too. Just go to appliedcuriositylab.com to join, or you can probably just pick your favorite search engine and type in Tribe of the Curious. And let's connect online at Becky Saltzman on Twitter and on Facebook at Applied Curiosity Lab. Finally, in order to avoid missing insights from outside the boundaries of ordinary, subscribe to Applied Curiosity Lab Radio on iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, and all the other places podcasts hide and wait to be discovered. In the meantime, elevate curiosity.